Good morning, Anthony. Looking forward to discussing the sable antelope this morning. Over to you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the sable antelope. The sable antelope. The uh, the the beautiful black and white, bold, heraldic looking antelope, um, which is also enticingly scarce in many of the more uh, well frequented national parks of Africa. Uh, for example, the sable antelope does not occur at all in the Serengeti. Uh, in Kruger National Park, it's decidedly scarce and always a prized sighting whenever tourists see it. Um, and, uh, you know, it tends to be an animal that kind of um, lives in out of the way places, Miombo woodland and um, not not the normal plains game situation. So it combines a certain quality of rarity with a with a. a, a, a well-recognized, spectacular appearance, um, you know, and, and differently from the greater kudu, which is equally beautiful and spectacular in its own way, it has a very masculine quality. The greater kudu is a kind of a feminine antelope. Even the, the mature males are, even though they're muscular and, and beautiful and long-horned, they've got a kind of a feminine delicacy about them, whereas in the sable antelope, there's not only black and white coloration, which is bold and, and, and uh, striking, but there's also a kind of a masculine quality even to the females. So it's a different energy. And it's easy yes, to see why the so antelope has gripped the human imagination. Absolutely. And uh, we saw a herd together maybe 10, 12 years ago in uh, Gorongosa. I wonder whether that herd is still around. Um, because I think at the time we were thinking they, they're likely to be on their way out because they're very scarce there, much like they're scarce in the Kruger Park. I'm not sure if we'll get to the topic in this podcast, but at some point I'd, I'd love to discuss the theories as to why the sable antelope has become scarcer uh, in the Kruger over the last 20, 30 years. You know, when I first visited the Kruger 40 years ago, we used to see sable and roan quite often. I would say most trips we saw them, strangely enough. They weren't common, um, definitely uncommon, but still common enough to see on most trips to the Kruger, whereas now you'll only see them one in 10, one in 20 trips. And uh, that is, it's interesting to discuss how the habitat may have changed or the predation patterns or um, something along those lines. But today we're going to be talking about their coloration. So uh, we probably need to park that topic. All righty. That sounds good. Um, yeah, well, the, the central puzzle, you know, going, be, going beyond the beautiful appearance of the animal, which captivates almost all naturalists, there's a deep um, puzzle that really challenges um, an understanding of biology to the limits. And, and there's no there's no significant literature on this. People just have not um, thought about this deeply enough. Uh, but, but the central puzzle of the sable antelope is why its females combine thoroughly conspicuous coloration on the face as well as on the rest of the figure with lethal looking horns, which are sharp pointed and straight enough to be deployed forwards, but curved enough to be deployed against the predator on the back of the animal. Um, now, that, that, that combination, um, oddly enough, uh, does not occur in any other of the hundreds of species of ruminants, uh, bovids and deer, of the world. Um, and it it's, it's even distinguishes the sable antelope from its nearest relatives, like the roan and the oryxes. Uh, the, the roan the has bold coloration on the face, but not on the rest of the figure. And the chimspok, uh, the South African oryx, has something approaching the same um, bold coloration, but it's not as unambiguously striking as in the sable antelope. Um, somebody might suggest that the sable antelope is colored to blend into the environment, given that it tends to be found at the edge of woodlands, you know, in glades in Miombo woodland, for example, where it's somewhat shady and somewhat um, full of vegetation clutter. So you could possibly make an argument that a small group of sable antelope in its normal habitat during the day, which is fairly wooded, might be somewhat disguised by its pattern of black and white. But I think there's a very tenuous explanation, because if it were true, uh, there would be many other examples among the, the dozens of woodland adapted deer and antelopes in the world that would show that same kind of bold black and white coloration. And there simply aren't any. So based on right. the unusual pa pattern of the sable alone, it does not seem likely that there's any part of the 
mature coloration of the sable antelope that is designed to hide the animal. There may be some inadvertent hiding in some situations. I'm not ruling anything out categorically. I'm just saying the, the selective forces that have produced the swartwit pence, you know, the, the white bellied and white um, bummed, white buttocked black animal are primarily um, advertisement, not concealment. Yeah. And so, so if we, yeah. No, thanks. I was just uh, going to remark what a wonderful puzzle it is. And yeah. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but what we'll be doing here is looking at an outlier amongst hundreds of different species to try and understand principles of coloration. Uh, is that is that correct? That's absolutely right. I mean, uh, the sable antelope is worth puzzling over for its own sake, but it also is a kind of... Um, I guess it's it, it, it's um, what's the right word? It it holds the key to an yeah. insight into coloration more broadly because it's such an extreme example that if you can unlock it and yeah. create a conceptual framework whereby you can at least hypothesize what's going on, that yeah. should greatly help um, attempts to generalize about how um, ungulates are, are achieve their their various yeah. colorations. Because you know among the, the hundreds of species of coloration of of ungulates in the world there's a tremendously interesting kaleidoscope of patterns and, and variants. Yeah, yeah. To put it another way and uh, to use some cliches, that most antelopes are shades of grey, whereas uh, the sable is a black and white case, and we just need to understand what that black and white case is. <laughs> yes, um, th that's a very good way to put it. Now, there, there are other black and white cases. I mean, for example, okay. the Rocky Mountain goat of the Pacific yeah. Northwest is, is a very white case. Um, the only part of it that's yeah. black are horns. Yeah. Um, and that, that uh, you know, I, I, I think we could we could devote a podcast to explaining that coloration. But what, what makes it slightly less interesting than the sable antelope is it's just simply white. Um, right. And th there's no particular facial coloration. The the part of the fascination of the sable antelope is that it has a particularly graphic black and whitish, blackish and whitish coloration on the face. Um, which is really quite odd for uh, for an antelope or a deer. So, mm. you know, first glance, at first glance, this pattern that we've we've uh, described here suggests aposematism, and aposematism is by definition warning coloration versus predators. Now, the the classic example of aposematism is skunks, yeah. because nobody thinks that that um, a skunk is uh, coloured to blend in to the to the environment. Um, it's quite obvious, in fact, it's a sort of classical, uh, self-evident fact uh, that, that, that skunks are, are coloured to stand out. And yeah. the, the, what everybody believes is that the reason why they've been selected evolutionarily to stand out is because they have a hidden weapon. So they can't, they yeah. can't advertise that weapon directly. What they, they don't do is they don't take out their um, venom gland, because it is a kind of a venom. Uh, just under their tail next to the anus and show it to the predator saying, this is what I have in store for you. They can't do that. They, yeah. uh, uh, prey animals can do that with teeth or claws or horns or whatever they can show them. You know, that's yeah. why a, that's why a, a cat will will um, uh, fang bear. That's yeah. why certain insects will spread their wings and, or, or various animals show their weaponry when they're under yeah. duress. But a skunk does not do that. And so that's why that's a large part of the reason why a skunk is so garishly colored is because it has to communicate to the predator that it has a, a serious defense that is non-apparent. So this is something that's not often specified in, in biology, biological definitions of aposematism. Aposematism is not just warning coloration. It's, mm. it's warning coloration of a of a non-apparent defense. A poison dart frog again is yeah. not garishly colored because it has some obvious weaponry. It's garishly yeah. colored because it just looks like a frog, but it happens to have a, have a non-apparent toxic skin. So, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, so just to review there, aposematism is not just warning coloration. It's, it's, it's coloration warning of a non-apparent defense. Now, um, this, this means that um, Although aposematism or warning coloration at first glance seems to be a plausible explanation for the coloration of the sable antelope, um, that uh, fails scrutiny when you when you actually come to think about it in any detail. 
So why is it that on, on closer scrutiny, the explanation of aposematic coloration breaks down in the case of the sable antelope? Well, the argument goes as follows. Firstly, um, no ungulate has ever been uh, been, been uh, described as aposematic. That may be a, a, you know, an enticing notion, but there's no such literature. Nobody has yeah. ever seriously hypothesized that any ungulate uh, let alone the sable antelope, um, is an example of aposematism. So if one were to make that example, you, you know, the burden would be on on showing it clearly because it's not something that you can just assume. Um, yeah. Secondly, there's only limited evidence that the sable antelope is apt to defend itself from predators by means of its horns um, any more than any other um, any other ruminant. I mean, the sable antelope, like the oryxes and like the roan antelope, does have a reputation for being ferociously defensive, but that may be more hype and imagination than reality. Mm. Um, our, our limited observations indicate that the sable antelope is more or less as vulnerable to predators as most other antelopes might be. So there may be a slight yeah. difference there, but it's not a the sort of categorical difference that you that you find in, for example, skunks. I mean, skunks yeah. are so perfectly horrid in their defense that they're, they're categorically better defended than comparable small carnivores. Yeah. That's the sort of thing you expect. Poison dart frogs are actually lethal. They're not just slightly noxious or bad tasting. They're categorically more dangerous for a, for a predator to, to consume than comparable non-toxic frogs. Now, secondly, um, uh, as we said, aposematism typically applies to non-apparent anti-predator defenses. But the, the thing about the sable antelope is that the, the apparent lethality of its horns is right out in the open. There's nothing hidden about that defense. And so the whole concept of aposematism doesn't make sense because all the animal should have to do is just show its horns. Why right. convert your entire coloration you know, around that theme if you can just simply brandish your horns? Because there's no mm. predator that stupid that doesn't understand what that means when you brandish your horns towards it. <laughs> yeah. um, then it's carrying on the, the list of, of, of sort of debunkings of, of the idea of aposematism in the sable antelope, the coloration and horns of the females seem to emulate those of the males. Um, mm. And in the males, the configuration of horns and coloration are more parsimoniously explained um, intraspecifically by, by means of a, an argument in, invoking masculine rivalry. If you see two um, mature male sable antelopes sparring, yeah. um, then the automatic assumption for, for a naturalist is that they are colored in that bold and brash way because many polygynous and sexually dimorphic mammals do have bold um, bodies, you know, masculine advertisement, um, a certain uh, penchant for risk and, and quite often quite, uh, you know, um, conspicuous features, whether they're manes or beards or conspicuous masculine coloration and so on. So the, the mm. coloration of the, of the male is not particularly surprising uh, and uh, for, considering that it is a masculine advertisement thing. And so the, 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 the female coloration emulates that. And so the more parsimonious explanation rather than aposematism is that the female is somehow emasculating itself to, for some social or sexual agenda. Um, then carrying on, um, the sable antelope uh, would be expected, if it's aposomatic, to be particularly defensive in its maternal protection of its infants and small juveniles. And that isn't true, because if anything, the sable antelope is particularly derelict in its um, mm. maternal instincts towards babies. Yeah. Uh, Dick Estes, who studied the sable antelope in detail, recorded instances where the mother and the infant lost touch for long periods. And, um, you know, there was no real protection of the, of the baby. Uh, the mother seemed perfectly nonchalant about it. And um, eventually when they were reunited, there was no big deal. And so it's almost as if, if the, if the sable antelope is particularly able to defend itself against predators with its rather purpose-built um, lethal looking horns, it kind of undermines that or anti-compensates for it by just having a particularly lax maternal policy. And so overall, it doesn't seem to be more protective against um, predators than it might be. So um, when you take all of those things together, there's a, only a weak argument for aposematism. Um, you know, and that, that brings us to a sort of subsidiary puzzle, which overlaps with, with what we've just described. Um, and that is as follows that, um, 
There are many bovids in which males and females look similar, okay, including wildebeests, oryxes, um, gamelisks like the, the topi and the tesubi, um, have, have a pattern in which it's difficult to tell male from female. And that's mainly because um, there's not much sexual dimorphism. Yeah. Uh, the, males, the males aren't particularly masculine looking. Um, and the females are um, relatively emasculate because they have horns and in some cases beards and be- and, and manes. And so mm. Dick Estes already 30 something years ago um, deeply pondered this because he studied animals like the sable antelope and the wildebeest in great detail as a field biologist. And he was really interested in their behavior. And he pondered this and came up with a hypothesis in which um, he explained the uh, sort of emasculation, the, the um, uh, masculine, uh, the convergence of, uh, in the female with masculine traits by invoking a kind of social and sexual framework. Now, what happens with many of these um, uh, ruminants is that the female and the, and the uh, coexist throughout the year. This is very different from deer. If you look at the various species of deer, mainly in the Northern Hemisphere, but also in Asia and South America, the general pattern with deer, antlered ruminants, yeah. is that the males and the females do not live together most of the time. They are sexually segregated. And because that's true, um, there's no real competition between the mature males and the juveniles and adolescents that they've fathered. Because when the juveniles and adolescents are uh, eating ferociously to grow into healthy adults prior to dispersal, prior to leaving their mothers, they do not have to uh, compete with bullying and experienced mature males because those yeah. males are foraging somewhere else. It's only in the rutting season that the two sexes come together. And then uh, foraging is the last thing on anybody's mind because it's just a kind of a mating frenzy. So that pattern of sexual segregation is normal for many of the world's ruminants, particularly the deer. When it comes to African antelopes, the opposite is normally the rule because for most African antelopes, they're territorial and the the sexes are non-segregated, which means that male and female have to live together. And when a male fathers young in a group and maintains the territory, then eventually when those young grow to juvenile and adolescent uh, age, a potential conflict arises because... Um, firstly, there's competition for food. The male is likely to try to get the best food for himself and to threaten any juvenile or adolescent that competes with him for the food. And more particularly, as the as the male juveniles and adolescents start to get secondary sexual characteristics, such as horns, adult coloration, manes and beards, they start to trigger the, uh, the ire of the territorial male. Even though the, 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 the juvenile involved may be the son of that same male in some cases, yeah. nonetheless, there's this almost blind emotional um, rage in which the male tends to chase out the potentially competing juvenile out of the territory because, of course, it's perfectly plausible for that juvenile to mate with the females when they come into estrus. And yeah. so instead of protecting his own offspring, the male will tend to ostracize and, and bully and, and persecute um, juveniles and adolescents, even including his own offspring. So, okay. uh, Dick Estes' explanation for this this um, masculine emulation that you find in wildebeests and um, various other bovids is that um, natural selection has produced uh, male-like horns and a male-like aggressive spirit in the females for the express purpose that the the females can defend their sons. That's delaying the point at which um, the territorial male drives out those sons into the wide and dangerous world. And that okay. that, that, that uh, boost to survivorship of the sons makes all the difference evolutionarily, which is why this pattern has evolved. And so he's, he's uh, by implication, uh, explaining the, the puzzle of the sable antelope in terms of that particular conceptual framework. He's saying the only reason why a sable antelope female looks like a male is black and white like a male and has lethal horns like a male is mm. not against predators, but because the female is is um, in a particular context or a particular uh, stage of the of the life cycle um, mm. able to give the, her sons that extra competitive edge in the world, which ultimately uh, makes all the difference. Uh, 
Okay, but why would it be useful to be black and white in that context? And also, why are African ungulates uh, not segregated like in Europe? I assume it's greater predation pressure, but but that that's an interesting well, thing um, to understand second, as well. I'll I'll deal with the second question first because I can easily just defer it. It's it's a fascinating okay. question in its own right, and it um it deserves a more than just a trivial answer. So. We okay. should we should pin that up and deal with it. You know why African antelopes are sexually non-segregated. Um, yeah. But turning yeah. to the other question, yes, you, you've nailed you've nailed a, a, a central problem here. If it's simply true that um, like wildebeests and um, uh, various other plains game, um, the females are simply emulating males in order to uh, put a kind of a protective force field around their own male offspring, their own sons then why are they black and white? Um, now, when one possible explanation is that because the males happen to be black and white for their own uh, social and sexual advertisement, the females go that extra step to emulate not just the horns and the demeanor of the males, but also their coloration. To the point that in the southern subspecies of the sable antelopes, like the, the subspecies that you find in the Kruger Park, uh, when the female becomes fully mature after quite a few years, her coloration is exactly like that of the male. It's fully pitch black, fully mm. snow white. You know, in the intermediate stages, she still is a bit browner than the male, but eventually yeah. she gets she gets 100% of the way. And then the only way that you can tell her apart from the male is because she's obviously smaller. She lacks a prepucial tuft, you know, lacks a penis, and she has noticeably shorter and straighter horns. So there's no real difficulty sexing the sable antelope, as there is, for example, in, in wildebeest, but nonetheless, sh she does fully emulate his coloration. And so then mm. the question becomes, why is he black and white in the first place? And so you go yeah. around full circle <laughs> to the idea that maybe he's black and white because he is aposomatic. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I, I don't think I've been particularly clear in sketching out this conceptual framework, um, but maybe listeners can get a, a, a taste of how um, exquisite the the concepts are here, and how uh, what an intellectual challenge it is to sort of figure out even how to begin thinking about this puzzle in the first place. Mm, mm. And do you have any uh, hypothesis for potentially breaking this uh, cir circular puzzle? Um, I, I hesitate to put any forward right now, um, but. Um, I think one 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 uh, angle of attack is to ask ourselves, well, what is it about the sable antelope that is different from yeah. other bovids, other ruminants, other antelopes in terms of habitat, diet, um, predatory environment, and so on? Um, and and one one thing that's worth mentioning here before we wrap up for today is is that. Um, the sable antelope does not like to be in the same kinds of situations as the as the sort of vulgar rank and file of plains game. So it doesn't mm. like to be around impalas and wildebeests and and the other herding thronging animals of the open grassland. And mm. that's partly because it doesn't seem to 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 be able to cope with the same kind of predatory pressures. Mm. And that, that that is one of the reasons that has been. Uh, offered for why uh, the sable antelope struggles in the Kruger Park, because Kruger Park is dominated by these vulgar, fecund, herding prey animals like wildebeest and impala, which support large densities of, of carnivores, such as the lion. And, yeah. and in those kind of situations, uh, the sable antelope does poorly, partly because it, it, it's sort of persecuted by the carnivores, and partly mm. because it's prone to diseases. Roan and sable antelopes are prone to diseases conveyed by the more uh, thronging um, okay. herding, herding plains. Mm. And so the typical habitat of a sable antelope is miombo woodland, a miombo glade, you know, what they call a dumbo, a little grassy patch in an infertile woodland where there's really not much going on. There aren't really very many ungulates. All game is rather scarce because of the infertility. And yeah. although there are carnivores, there's a relatively sparse density of carnivores, which means that the overall predation regime is not particularly hectic. Okay. So once one understands that, you can maybe start to piece together a rationale. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Are they are they less fecund than the impala, for example? 
No, this is a fascinating thing. You know, there's really surprisingly little variation in fecundity among the various ruminants of the world. The hundreds of species of ruminants, ranging mm. from royal antelopes, barely the size of a hare, through to giant buffaloes and, you know, uh, deer through to bovids and all kinds of strange ruminants. They basically have a single kind of fecundity, um, just like they have a single level of metabolism. And the only real variation is by skipping a breeding season. For example, if you go to the musk ox, which lives in the Arctic, in the harshest possible environment, that yeah. animal is not inherently less fecund in the sense that there's no real alteration in its growth rate, its um, gestation period, its lactation period. All those parameters are pretty much predictable from all other ruminants. But what yeah. it does is it skips breeding seasons. That's that's the main way that that uh, some ruminants that live in extremely challenging environments are less fecund than other ruminants in more favorable environments is they just skip breeding seasons. So the reproductive okay. output of the female over her lifetime can be half that in a more uh, productive environment. But it's not because of any fundamental uh, alteration to the settings of fecundity. It's just simply because, you know, um, some years the animals just don't come into estrus. They just don't have the condition that enables them to to, to breed. Yeah, um, yeah. But now com coming back to the sable antelope, there's no evidence that the sable antelope is any less fecund than a wildebeest, for example. Interesting. Um, Despite yeah. the lack of uh, nutrients in the typical habitat, Myombo, I would have thought that wildebeest on a fertile plain in the Serengeti would be breeding like the clappers compared with a sable on nutrient poor sandy soils in Mayombo. Well, you know, then when you ask the question that way, it's a fascinating and, and underplayed question. It's, it's a very, very good question. But my answer would be that it is not the reproduction or the fecundity that, that changes adaptively in those situations. It's the density of the animals. So if you look at a, okay. a, a, at a, a square kilometer of Miombo and compare it with a square kilometer of Highfelt, for example, or Serengeti open grassland, the fecundity of the various ruminants that live in those disparate habitats are exactly the same relative to body mm. size, but what's different is the density of animals, the number of animals per hectare. So yeah. in the Miombo, you may have only have five individual sable antelopes to a square kilometer, yeah. Whereas in the productive uh, grasslands on basalt in the Kruger Park, for example, you might have uh, one or two orders of magnitude more than that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's the difference. So the one theory I remember hearing about as far as the Sable and Rome go in the Kruger Park is that over the last few decades, uh, <clears throat> well, many decades ago, the, the Kruger Park management started putting in more water sources. <clears throat> boreholes, windmills, and uh, that enabled the spread of um, uh, of animals like wildebeest and impala into areas where they previously were un very uncommon. And that brought in the lions, which in turn um, uh, caused the the sable and roan to be uh, to be preyed upon at a rate that they couldn't tolerate. Um, which is, you know, linking back to fecund fecundity is a bit strange, is it not? Um, and that surely the the um, the fecundity could combat the lions. Um, what am I missing there? Oh uh, yes, uh, I, I, I'm I'm not sure I can explain this clearly, but um, I do believe that I understand it because it's an argument that applies to um, to why zebras are striped. Um, yeah. Uh, I think the idea is basically that, um, let's see if I can get it right. Okay. Imagine a situation where you've got um, a thousand wildebeests and 20 sable antelopes. Now, yeah. those thousand wildebeests, they support a certain large number of lion because the lion are, de are depending mainly on the fecundity of the wildebeest to sustain them. But yeah. they'll pick off the, the um, sable antelopes at the rate that they encounter them. Yeah. Okay. Now, the only way that that um, population of sable antelopes can survive that kind of, of, of um, persecution is if they have the same kinds of anti-predator adaptations that the wildebeest do. They run as fast, they're as vigilant, they're as fecund and so on. But if a sable antelope is adapted more to a miombo type of woodland where predation is relatively relaxed, then it may not be as efficient 
in its uh, anti predator vigilance or flight and so on. Uh, yeah, that so makes example, a lot of sense. You know, many of the, the planes game, Wildebeest, Topi, uh, Blessbok, and so on, uh, particularly the, the Cessabee, are extremely fast and enduring runners because they have to contend not just with the lion that, that ambushes and pounces, but also with cursorial predators like the African hunting dog and the spotted hyena. So they really are okay. extremely, extremely cursorial fut- fugitive animals. The, the sable yeah. antelope is like that. It's, you know, it's a competent runner, but there's yeah. nothing particularly um, specialized about it when it comes to uh, either detecting or, or fleeing from predators. And so it's easy to imagine that um, that the sable antelope gets differentially persecuted in a situation where it's surrounded by huge numbers of fecund uh, bovine, you know, prey animals like wildebeest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, no, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for filling in that little gap in my understanding there. And I, I, I hear that the authorities are shutting down water points to try and assist the sable so, um, and roan. So let's see if that works. Yes, well, um, they, they have been doing that for some time, but from what you say, it doesn't sound like it's working because, um, you know, they, they started shutting the water down decades ago. Uh, it doesn't yeah. seem like the, the sable and the run have really burgeoned in that period. No, no. It would be interesting to try and get some data on that. Uh, yeah. Then a, a few other questions, if you don't mind. Um, do you think that that Apostomatic coloration is, uh, having thought about this for decades yourself, do you veer more towards the black and white being a flag for the predators or for one another, you know, intraspecific or interspecific? Well, uh, I can't see much evidence for aposemitism, so I can't see much evidence for the interspecific explanation. And that's because, as we've said, um, it doesn't seem like the sable antelope is particularly good at defending itself from predators overall. Yeah. Um, and it almost seems that that if it is true that the sable antelope is somewhat more lethal towards a lion than, say, a kudu, that's more like a side effect of the um, lethality of the horns that was evolved in an intraspecific or sociosexual context. So you see, yeah. this is where it gets conceptually very fuzzy because... Imagine the following scenario, that for some reason, because of the ecology and the gregariousness and the, the habitat of this particular animal, the sable antelope has evolved this particular socio-sexual system in which there's considerable sexual dimorphism with the male being large and with longer horns, but the females also have advertisement coloration, and that's mainly to defend their sons and so on. And so those horns, those rather purpose-built, dangerous-looking horns of the females are mainly socio-sexually selected. But at the same time, mm. they can be turned to some degree towards predators as well. So the two things are not completely uh, exclusive. Yeah. Um, okay. But overall, I don't see enough evidence that a sable antelope is is a is an anti-predator um, is is ad- adapted particularly in an anti-predator sense um, mm. to explain its coloration that way. And so I'm edging towards the idea where, for some reason, the sable antelope has this socio-sexual advertisement coloration. Um, so they're warning, the females are warning the males uh, to not mess with their sons. Um, the, that's the black and white pattern. Like just the females are saying, just remember me, I've also got these horns and don't mess with my sons. Is, that's the hypothesis, is it? Well, that that would be um, the hypothesis, according to Richard Estes, who has never been debunked, um, except yeah. that Richard Estes used it mainly for things like wildebeest, which don't have particularly conspicuous coloration. So uh, his 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 explanation seems to apply, but there's still something to be explained because most of the animals he invokes in his explanation are not extreme, mm. extremely colored animals like the sable antelope. Yeah. Um, so there's still yeah. something something odd there. So so that's why I mean. Yeah. yeah. So I would I, I would have thought that we need to think deeply about how nutrient poverty in a Mayumba woodland uh, could lead to uh, black and white coloration in an antelope feeding in that woodland. What of what 
how does nutrient fertility link to coloration? Um, you know, one thought that comes to mind is nutrients are more valuable in that myombo system. So if you accumulate them, uh, the, there's greater value in that flesh. <laughs> um, in the sable flesh, sable flesh is more valuable than uh, in a mamba woodland than in a um, than wildebeest flesh on the Serengeti because it's just it's cheap. It's it, the nutrients are so freely available. Um, it's kind of disposable flesh, whereas the flesh full of nutrients in Mamba woodland is it's a hell of a thing to produce it because it uh, because of the rarity of the nutrients. Um, do you see yes, some I, angle there? I, I, I kind of follow that. But again, you see, if, if that were true, then you would expect um, an effect on fecundity. How about the following? OK, this is a, mm. perhaps a less, perhaps perhaps a more direct explanation. And I've never mm. thought of this before. It's only when we discussed this that this popped into my mind. Imagine yeah. a, Miombo, a, a Miombo ecosystem. Now, yeah. Whether you're a, a male or a female or a, a, a juvenile or an adolescent, male or female, you depend on certain windows of opportunity in this largely vegetation cluttered, nutrient poor, fibrous environment called Miombo. Yeah. That yeah. is partly keyed by fire. OK, now the way the sable antelope survives in, in, a, in a vegetation that's largely green hell, it largely consists of unpalatable vegetation. Yeah. Um, but, but because there are certain opportunities, it can survive by um, moving around in the right way and attending to the right uh, situations. Now, what you have is a combination of the Dambo effect. And what we mean by a Dambo is a small glade of poorly drained soil where the trees give way to grasses. And there's a kind of an accumulation of clay that makes the soil just locally over a period over, over a scale of a few meters squared at a time more fertile than in the surrounding sandy Miombo woodland. Okay, so you've got a, a localized concentration of nutrients together with yep. a retention of, of water in the dry season. And then you've got yep. a fire pattern as well. Okay, so yep. in this overall uninhabitable green hill that we call Miombo woodland, which is largely devoid of large game and predators over most of South Central Africa, what you yep. have is um, a situation where sometimes you'll have a dumbo and sometimes that dumbo will have been burnt at a particular time. And yeah. there's, so a, there's a limited green flush of nutrient rich grass that comes up um, sort of uh, stochastically across the landscape, at, you know, scattered here and there. Now, yeah. because because the resource is so scattered, as opposed to the sort of extensive lawns available to wildebeest, there's yeah. intense competition potentially between the uh, mature males and their uh, adolescent or juvenile offspring. And so yeah. it's, it becomes a matter of life and death whether a female can fend off a bullying male to give yeah. her own son that, that extra edge. Um, mm. And you see, if this is true, I don't think this has ever been hypothesized before. Um, it's a way of invoking the, the, the particular habitat of the sable antelope to um, explain why it has a particular incentive or a particular premium on this yes. maternal defense angle. Right. No, fascinating idea. And uh, yeah, the, the difference between Mayombo woodland and the Serengeti is, is so stark. It's, it, it makes sense to me that the, the explanation for the difference in coloration between wildebeest and sable is going to lie in that, that understanding of how ex the, the, the most extreme, extreme differences between the Serengeti Plains and the Mamba Woodlands, and I think you, uh, you know, cer certainly we edging towards that. Um, yeah. no, exciting concept. And um, does roan antelope uh, occur in, in in similar habitat, or is it is it more on the edge? Sometimes being in more nutrient-rich areas, because you know maybe we can use this whole outlier concept. Uh, Roan isn't quite as extreme as sable, so is its habitat also not quite as extreme? Um, and could we also use, you know, when I say not quite as extreme, I'm meaning in terms of 
green hill um, of nutrient poverty. And could we use the giant sable as another way to, to another thing to bring into this thought experiment in that? Um, well, is it an even more extreme territory? And does that lead to, you know, a difference in size in some shape or form as well? Nutrient poverty leading to greater size, and which would also, you know, doesn't occur in the Serengeti with the, the wildebeest. Uh, the males and females are approximately the same size, aren't they? Yeah, well, um, the giant sable, I feel, is more like a delicious distraction than something truly important at a conceptual level. It's just found in a small part of Angola. And it's only yeah. distinctive because um, there's a large swathe of miombo in eastern Angola that is devoid of yeah. all sable antelopes. So the sable antelope, the main difference between sable and roan is that the sable is much more restricted in its distribution, whereas the roan is widespread all the way from Senegal in far west Africa through to Ethiopia and Sudan and then south, uh, originally all the way to the southern tip of Africa, but certainly into South Africa. So any infertile woodland across Africa tends to have roan antelope. And, um, and so the argument that applies to the sable antelope should also apply to the roan antelope. And indeed, the roan antelope is truly odd among ruminants in having this bold, dark and pale pattern on the face of both sexes. But the yeah. way it differs from the, from the sable is that there's nothing particularly odd about the coloration over the rest of the body, which is just very uh, un, you know, unremarkable brown. But, mm. but, but, you know, if you invoke a, a, an, a, an Estes-like explanation of maternal protection of juveniles and adolescents from territorial males, that would equally apply to the roan, because indeed the, the roan females, again, have a combination of aposomatic-looking coloration on their faces and lethally-shaped horns. Yeah. So that, that same argument applies. And it would have the same explanation, which is that the in, in the infertile situations typically inhabited by the roan antelope, there's going to be a premium on uh, maternal defense of the rights of juvenile and adolescent males yeah. that um, sets the roan antelope apart from the sort of vulgar and rank and file plains game, such as wildebeests. Great. Uh, uh, how much bigger is the giant sable than the... The normal sable? Oh, not that much bigger. Um, the okay. the normal sable male is about 250 kilograms. The giant sable would maybe be 300. Um, it's not a big deal. They're, 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 the giant sable is celebrated mainly because the horns are noticeably longer. It's not mm. so much the body that's much bigger. The horns are much bigger. Um, you know, it's, it's a case of the, the sable being so spectacular in the first place that a somewhat more spectacular sable is, is going to be celebrated remarkably. But it, it, there, there are many um, lineages of ruminants in which the differences are far greater than that. So okay, the, okay. the giant sable is, is, a, is, a, is a celebrated animal, but not a particularly ecologically significant one, if you see what I'm saying. Would you think that the myombo that it does occur in in Angola is particularly could be particularly poor in nutrients, or is that the, you're not aware of that? And I think it is. I think it is because um, most of most of Angola, um, most of the Angolan myombo, the myombo covers perhaps a third of Angola, and yeah. most of the Angolan myombo is devoid of the sable antelope. So you have the sable antelope in Zambia. And then there's a stretch of hundreds of kilometers westward in which you have no sable antelope until you find the small isolated population in north central mm. Angola that is uh, that that is called the the giant sable. Okay. So clearly, okay. you know, and, and even in the in the Miombo of Zambia and Tanzania, the sable antelope is localized. It's, it's not found widely through the um, Miombo. It tends to be found in sort of semi Miombo, Miombo at the edge of something slightly more productive. So all of these concepts are very, are very subtle and complicated, and it's difficult to say anything in black and white. But I think everybody yeah. agrees that, number one, the, the, the sable tends to be associated with relatively infertile landscapes. And yeah. number two, the sable does not tend to do well when it's thrown in among um, the rank and file of, of dense thronging plains game attended by large densities of predators. I think everybody would agree with that. Right. Okay. Uh, and there's just possibly a correlation with nutrient 
poverty that the the, the, the size of the sable gets uh, larger uh, with a more extreme nutrient poverty. There's a hint of that. There, there is a hint of that, um, but it's also true to say that the you know the the, the broad sweep of 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 populations of the sable, the southern and um, and the, well, the, the the South African and the and the um, Zimbabwean and Zambian and southern Tanzanian sables, they're not remarkable for their body size. They're pretty average for a large antelope in their body size. It's not like any kind of gigantism occurs as a result of nutrient poverty or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, thanks very much, Anthony. I, I'm sure uh, we'll have uh, additional podcast on this puzzle as, as new ideas uh, come to mind. Thanks yes, a lot. Well, um, thank you and, and, and thanks to listeners. Listeners, please chip in. Um, please take what we've said here and, uh, and, and uh, thrash it out and criticize it and offer your own ideas because this is a, an unexplained puzzle. And um, we're just spitballing here and coming up with a few ideas, but Many of you out there can probably outthink us on this question and um, come up with a better explanation for why uh, the sable antelope has this peculiar pattern of having females combining black and white coloration with uh, rather lethal looking horns. So um, uh, until we meet again, um, thanks for listening. Uh, like, subscribe and share and uh, checking out for now. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. I'll just add a parting comment that why I like these thought experiments and just exposing these puzzles is that it gives one uh, a new search image or it almost gives you a different pair of lenses or glasses to, to look through when uh, watching the animal in question, and in this case, a sable antelope. I, I, for one, am going to look at it from so many different uh, angles now and uh, I'm itching to get on to YouTube to look at sable antelope videos. So thanks very much for providing uh, those new search images for me. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, thank you. And I look forward to our next um, podcast. Excellent. Have a good day. Cheers. Have a good day. Cheers. Out for now.